Can, can we move on now to the, the wider issue of um, what people are calling the new atheism, and um, the obviously polarisation between creationism and, and atheism, and, and the, the public debate that's going on at the moment, um, which uh, some people say is as vociferous as what was going on in the 1860s, and, and, that, and that there hasn't been so much interest in this interface and the question of the existence of God and the relationship between science and religion you know, since that time. Some of these books on new atheism have sold hundreds of thousands of copies, uh, whereas the, the refutations of them by, by people like Keith Ward uh, hardly sell anything at all, and they get very little publicity. Mm. And, and so there's a whole there's another issue about the the, the media exposure of um, atheism mm. and, and, and those sort of positions as against the, the sort of uh, debate level of debate that one would expect in the media mm. and of looking at alternative views. Well, I, w I was just going to comment on that, and, and this is really to do with publicity. Uh, the publicity machine for Dawkins's book would be very much better than the publicity machine for Keith Ward's book. Um, I don't know how many television shows Keith Ward went on, but I suspect that they were a fraction of the ones that Dawkins went on when his book came out. And in one sense it's much easier to say something absolutely ridiculous like Dawkins does and people can grasp the concept very quickly and um, it, it makes much better television than a, a more reasoned debate that Keith Ward would go. But I think, but I think also, I mean, there are certain uh, elements in the, the atheist critique of religion which many people could agree with. I mean, you, we started by talking about the Thirty Years' War uh, and the intolerance uh, and the fanaticism. Uh, yes. And this, is, this is something that you know, people with different view and different use of reason being talking about we could we could readily agree with that, but it doesn't but it doesn't mm. mean to say that we are just as bad as as, as the rest of them, as it were. Mm. I think that the reason for the rise of the new atheism was people are frightened of Islamic fundamentalism. They're frightened of the Christian right. They don't like George Bush, and they identify George Bush with right wing Christianity, creationism, and so forth. So there are lots of reasons why I think that the, materi the materialist orthodoxy, the people who believe in the kind of Enlightenment rationalism in its rather dogmatic form, felt threatened. And I think this is a backlash, this evangelical atheism that's going on at the moment. I think in a way it's done as a service. I think probably in America it was liberating for a lot of people to, to be able to come out in the open and say they were atheists. And most people in England seem to be atheists in the open. I mean, it's not an issue here, but in America it was an issue. Um, but I think, above all, what they've done is the people like Dawkins have crystallised the atheist materialist position, put it there in a clear form that you can actually see what this belief system is. I found it very hard to argue against atheism and materialism until recently because the, there were very few examples where people had actually stated it explicitly. It was a kind of yes. implicit belief yes. system, yes. very widespread among intellectuals and scientists, but implicit and elusive, because they'd say, oh, that's not what I really mean, or something, when you've dealt with one of the more ridiculous points. Dawkins puts it all out there in a very clear way, and so do his co-religionists, you know, the, the, his co-atheists, the Hitchens and people. Polemical, strident, but... Uh, put there in a sort of clear way. And it's easier to see what the belief system is that they're defending. And I think that precisely because of that, its limitations are now becoming much more apparent. So there's a sort of dialectical process, so, so one can get a handle on it and therefore one can respond Yes, um, and clearly. I th exactly. Mm. And I think mm. that it enables clearer responses to be made. I mean, there are all sorts of responses that people have made. I mean religious wars, okay, what about Stalin, he's an atheist. I mean, it's now clear to most people that, you know, lots of human beings have behaved badly, including atheists, and there's actually some flaw in human nature. Well, it's, it's that's not exactly a new insight. No, as Keith Ward <laughs> said uh, recently at a meeting he had in Cambridge, he said it's not religion that's dangerous, it's human beings who are dangerous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which other? Now, j just to finish off, um, how, how, do you, how would you forecast the the general view on, on uh, consciousness in, let's say, 20 years' time. What, how do you think things might have changed? Or do you have two scenarios that you could maybe speculate on? Um, I think that uh, 
my own views about this is that the, the views on consciousness are going to change and really quite dramatically. Uh, they're going to do it in two ways. A, because there is going to be a lot more evidence for mind beyond the brain and people will have to start incorporating that into their theories. But I think the, the other point is that our understanding of the actual physics of the world itself is, is slowly changing so that um, the idea that you can have systems, complex systems like brains which are isolated is going to be seen as, as frankly ridiculous, particularly because they have their tentacles out into the social processes and distant perceptual processes. So I think that consciousness is going to become uh, much more scientifically acceptable and, and the theories are going to, uh, are going to involve uh, the extension of mind at a distance. So uh, my, my own view is that it's going to go on in the way that we see these very, very, very early, tenuous beginnings. Rupert? Yes, I think so too. I agree with that. And I think one of the things that's happened is as a result of the fact that consciousness is now firmly on the scientific agenda. For the last 15 or 20 years, the debate has been intensifying about consciousness. Like Peter, when I was a, a, a student, I, mean, I was studying physiology at Cambridge. It wasn't mentioned; it just, as it was ignored completely. Yes, yes. Now it's not ignored, and there's lots of books and discussions and conferences on consciousness. And when the materialists push their views of consciousness to the limits that people like Dennis and Nicholas Humphrey do, it becomes clear that this position is very hard to defend. It's untenable that you can't just conjure consciousness up from blind in uh, uh, physical processes that totally lack it. They're trying to pull the rabbit of consciousness out of the hat, as if by magic, and it just doesn't work. And when you look at the arguments, when they're subjected to scrutiny, it turns out they don't hold up very well. And I think that within the consciousness studies area, first the idea was in the 70s and 80s that the brain's just a computer doing information programming. Yes. Mm. And yes. now they've dropped that. Now, yes. now Damasio comes along and says, well, actually, our mental processes are influenced by emotion. Well, this is big news in the scientific world. I mean, it's not big news to most people, no, uh, certainly not yes. to most women. Um, mm. That um, And then uh, they now discover that our minds are embodied, that uh, it's not just disembodied information processing. So we've now got, as mainstream views, that we have embodied minds influenced by emotion. Now, we're uh, more or less now at the level that common sense has been at forever. Yes. Uh, but yeah. this has come into science and so yeah. even within mainstream, so this process is leading to a broadening of the view of consciousness. And I think, as Peter says, more research and more interest in this topic is going to break out of this narrow dogmatic limitation. I think these things are bound to change. And the, the people who are defending the old orthodoxy, dogmatic materialism, dogmatic atheism, are now being seen increasingly by most other people as exactly that, dogmatic. And um, I think there are a lot of people who'd like to see science being much more open, more curious, including a lot of young people, and including a lot of people who now work in, within science who come from non-Western backgrounds, from India, from China, from South America, uh, people who haven't got any particular axe to grind for this particular kind of European 19th century atheism. It's after all never taken a very deep root even in the US. No. It's a pecu mm. peculiarly cultural phenomenon of Western Europe in reaction against the Catholic Church and the Protestant reformers and so forth. It's come out of this, this particular kind of atheism is a kind of extreme Protestantism that's sort of turned on religion itself. It's culturally limited and it's not really relevant to people coming from other cultures who increasingly uh, make up a, a lot of the proportion of people working within science. I think it's bound to change. Well, Peter and Rupert, thank you very much indeed, and I'm sure that will have given rise to, to many questions and points of discussion. Oh, thank you. Mm. Good. Thank Good. you. Excellent. Great.